can I start by congratulating everybody that made it here to the final session? Um, it's, uh, I'm really grateful for so many of you coming when so few of our panelists have managed to make it to the final session. But um, we have got three panelists here. My name is Lawrence Pratchett. I'm from the University of Canberra. I'm not an expert on tourism, but I used to be dean of our business school at University of Canberra, and I did have tourism within uh, my faculty. So I did take the time to speak to some of my tourism experts back in Canberra uh, before I came. A couple of opening comments that I want to make about the tourism industry um, in Asia. Uh, pr probably those of you who are very interested in tourism already know these figures, but I'm going to repeat them anyway, just so that we've all got a context. Um, roughly a billion, um, just over a billion people are tourists every year. Um, someti sometimes that's the same people more than once, um, but a billion tourists every year. Um, Half of those go to Europe, or are within Europe, but a quarter of uh, all tourists, or 23%, um, come to Asia, or Asia and Pacific. So it's not, it's not, the, not um, Asia, Asia Pacific as in uh, the west coast of America, but it is Asia and the Pacific Islands and so on. Um, in 2014, 263 million people uh, were tourists in Asia. They accounted, as I said, about 23% of the global uh, tourism industry. But interestingly, 30% of the global receipts um, in 2014. That was $377 billion, apparently. Um, tourism is a major export for virtually every country in the world. Overall, it ranks fourth uh, in the world, but for many Asian countries, it's the first and most important export. So it's important to think of uh, tourism not simply as something we do with our leisure, but something which is a major industry um, worth about $1.5 trillion, I'm told. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is that um, Southeast Asia in particular has seen incredible growth in terms of its tourism attraction in the last uh, five to six years. Um, grown by 49% between 2010 and 2015 were the figures I was given, but I understand that it's still continuing to grow at a similar rate even now. Um, the third point I wanted to make is really around um, China and uh, Kay and I have been talking a little bit about this um, before, we sat, before we sat down as well. But China has, as we all know, has become a significant uh, investor in tourism. Uh, the growth in Chinese tourists coming to all parts of the world, but particularly to Asia, is phenomenal, really. Um, in 2016, more than 20 million Chinese people visited Asia, con contributing $261 billion to the Asian economy in that year. Um, it's been the top spender into the Asian economy since 2012 in terms of tourism. If we take Singapore as an example, Singapore gets about 17 million uh, visitors a year, of which um, in 2017, 3.2 million were Chinese. Um, I think if you go back 15 years, there were hardly any Chinese visitors to Singapore. So um, what we see is a significant impact in, of Chinese visitors in particular in Asia. And if I take my own country, Australia, we get more than a million Chinese visitors now um, per year. And the interesting fact that I've been given about Chinese visitors to Australia is that they, on average, spend six times per night um, on their stay in Australia than the mean average of visitors to Australia. So they are significant contributors to the Australian economy as well. But we also know that t with tourism comes a whole set of challenges. Um, this panel is specifically supposed to be talking about infrastructure, um, and infrastructure is a challenge to making uh, tourism work, particularly in Asia, where um, there isn't a sh hasn't always been a tradition of, of people traveling and visiting as much. So airports, hotels, restaurants, and so on are all important parts of the physical infrastructure that are that are required, um, good public transport from airports into cities and so on. Um, I have spent hours trying to get into Kuala Lumpur before now from uh, the airport and so on. Uh, they put you off being a tourist if it takes so long to travel. So creating that infrastructure is important. Having the right forms of attraction that, that will bring um, 
tourists, not less necessarily in large numbers, but will actually provide the experiences that they want. Um, coping with the disasters that afflict many countries, um, we know the physical disasters around volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis and so on that have had an impact on the tourism industry in Asia, but also the medical uh, disasters like SARS which have um, at times affected the uh, tourism industry again in Asia but also globally. So thinking about those types of things are really important and of course um, the governance of tourism is important. I'm going to give you a very quick story here. Um, I'm very fortunate as a um, senior person at the University of Canberra to visit Bhutan regularly because we have a partnership there. Bhutan is an interesting country for tourism. I don't know how many of you know this but they have a law which requires you to spend per person $250 per day, US dollars per day in the country. And you have to show receipts to do that. You have to book through a tourism company. That means that they restrict very much who goes into the country, not by making a decision around, around race, not by making a decision around age, but just simply by putting a significant tax in effect on the tourist. It means that they get high quality tourism um, a lot and very small numbers, but it's actually high quality in terms of the, the money that it brings into the country. And it means that the ecosystem that they have that is attractive to um, tourists, that is visiting a country which still um, dresses in traditional clothes, still leaves a traditional life, um, can, can be maintained alongside a net import or, a, or a, sorry, a net export, I suppose, of tourism uh, that has an impact that they want. So I give you that example as a way of thinking about how tourism in different countries works in different ways. I'm not going to pick on those countries that I think do it badly, but I'm sure you can all be thinking of those countries where they just have an influx of um, low-cost tourists. Actually, now I think about it, Australia has a tendency to do that because when I said that Chinese people spend six times more than the mean average, that's partly because the majority of tourists to Australia are backpackers who seek to spend as little as possible per day uh, in Australia and seek to um, work as much as they can. Um, we're quite happy with that because they do contribute to our economy in other ways, but it's a different form of tourism than that you get in Bhutan. The way we're going to run the panel today is that I'm going to ask the ones that haven't arrived to stay silent um, and I'm going to ask each of the three panellists that we have here to just say briefly, probably not as briefly as I was going to make you um, comment, um, a little bit about um, who you are, what you do and then to address the, the panel's two key questions if we can, which is... Um, what new models can integrate related industries in the tourism industry and how shall multi-centre and multi-country tourism be promoted while also pr protecting fragile ecosystems? Having said that, I'm, I think we're more interested um, in a more general sense about what tourism can contribute to the economies in Asia and how we can actually grow that um, economy successfully in order to deliver sustainable tourism for the future. I'm going to start with Kay, just because he sat on my left. So Kay Shibata, please. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Kei Shibata. I'm, uh, I'm originally from Tokyo, Japan. I was born and raised. And then now I'm, uh, um, I, I, actually, I actually have uh, two homes now, Singapore and Tokyo, going back and forth every every month, seven hour commute routine. So, uh, um, and the, over the last 17 years, so I've been running uh, the company I started. It's an online travel company. Um, it's the, uh, uh, we have a website called uh, uh, Line Travel JP and also the Trip 101. Uh, the boss of the website is actually a consumer fronted website. So we basically uh, publish a lot of content. For example, if you are looking for the new idea of the destinations, you know, you come to our websites and then you can probably find the articles like a top, here's a top 10 things to do in Hong Kong or something. Um, anyway, so uh, um, I, I've been deeply involved in a, in a travel industry for the last uh, 17 years, and uh, particularly you know, uh, wearing the hat of an entrepreneurs. 
and also uh, been in deeply involved in the technology times uh, travel. So, uh, um, and then also the, uh, I also sometimes wear the hat of an um, angel investor in, in travel, travel tech startups. So, uh, um, so far I've been, I've invested probably like 12 different startups um, across Asia. Um, some of them in actually yeah, North, North, North America as well. And uh, lastly, I am also um, running uh, uh, one international conference in Tokyo called Web in Travel, which is the uh, uh, which focus on technology and travel. And the uh, um, we we do this uh, conference every uh, every June or July, and then have a company like uh, Expedia, Airbnb, Booking.com. Those companies, and then everybody actually get together and and, and talk about the future of travel. So, I have like a few different hats to wear, and then you know I'm happy to actually uh, contribute some um, from my brain, which is actually trained uh, for the last uh, 17 years. Thank you, Kay. Um, Diana, can we come to you next, please? Hello. Um, my name is Dina, and um, I started a um, business aviation company 20 years ago. When I first started the company, um, there was only two private jets in Asia, uh, namely in Hong Kong. Um, there was no infrastructure. There was absolutely nothing. And um, the reason I started that uh, is because um, my family was um, courted by uh, one of the manufacturer, uh, one of the biggest uh, business aviation manufacturer in the world. And um, basically they say, oh, can you help us to sell private jets in, um, in Hong Kong, Macau, and China? And um, my brother took up the assignment without even thinking about it, and, and, uh, and he dumped it on me. So uh, I picked up uh, you know, the business contract, and I look at it, how do I start, all right? And 20 years ago, business aviation is still quite, you know, is quite small in Europe, and North America is quite prevalent at the time. So um, there was no infrastructure, okay? And uh, very few airports in Asia has accepted, you know, private jets. So I really have to lobby. And at the time, Hong Kong was very bold. They opened a business aviation service center at the newly built Chalapcourt Airport. <laughs> so, and there was one Swiss company um, that had open office in Singapore, but absolutely no business. So, we put our heads together and basically, you know, start selling the product first. Once you have the demand, once you sell the products um, and the services begin to, you know, to, to start. Nowadays, we have over 600 aircraft in the region and, and the movements per day in, in Hong Kong. Before it was like one or two movements a month, uh, 20 years ago. Now you get a few, couple hundred of movements every day in Hong Kong. So um, basically what I'm trying to say is even infrastructure, uh, if you have the demand and, and then, you know, um, we, we set up what we call the association and, and we start lobbying the different governments and to get governments, to, you know, uh, to see the benefits of what um, this private jet travel, um, what kind of travelers it will bring. Actually, normally, um, in the first um, you know, 10, 15 years, mainly those travelers were investors. Major, major big investor of Fortune 500 companies. They come to Asia, they look at you know, opportunities, and, and the government realized that if they bring in those people, um, you get investments. So that's one way of uh, growing the industry. The sec nowadays, uh, it has becoming quite a habit now for, for a lot of what we call fund managers um, to use private jet for, for fundraising and also for consumers. People now thinking of going on vacations, 
Um, so, so they hire, you know, or the charter private jets. And because of that, the whole industry grow. It becomes a very, um, you know, I mean, one, one of the biggest employer. And, and um, in, in a lot of, um, you know, uh, countries, and uh, um, we are now having a lot of issues. We, uh, we can't find pilots uh, because pilots are very difficult to find nowadays. Uh, not sufficient mechanics and uh, even people working in the industry. Now, you know, governments, uh, in, you know, especially Hong Kong right now, they realize that aviation is a major sector. So they are putting in a lot of money into um, education. Um, they have built an uh, aviation academy, and uh, colleges are now offering aviation, uh, what we say, um, um, education and degrees, etc. So, so it can really uh, spill over to other areas um, if it's taken the right way. And um, because I've been in this industry for 20 years, um, I see, um, and if you're bold enough, uh, you can create a whole entire new product out of, um, you know, the private jet travel. And one of the product that we are um, focusing on right now is medical tourism. So uh, a lot of countries in Asia at the moment, um, p places like Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, they have a very good medical system. And and one way, you know, is to promote that and, and uh, whether they travel by private jet or not, but it's a way of promoting it. And another, um, another um, sector that we see a lot um, and is growing is pet travel. Because in Asia, um, your, your pet can, um, can only go into the cargo hold. So, um, and if you don't want your pet to be traumatized, uh, better hire a private jet. And so private jet travel is becoming a, um, a quite a novelty now in Hong Kong. And um, so, so Japan is one of the recipient countries that is accepting private, you know, uh, I mean, tra people tra coming over to Japan for, you know, with their pets. And um, there's quite a lot of hotels that are gearing up to that kind of uh, uh, tourists, okay? So, um, you know, um, if you already have some, some of the infrastructure, all you need to do is to promote and build some marketing programs on, on products that you can sell. And one of it, another type of products that um, is becoming quite popular is wireless travel. Uh, people, um, you know, um, looking for um, retreats, et cetera, and they will travel long distance to go to those destinations. And you can always package it up with a type of service and grow the business. Thank you, Diana. We'll, we'll come back to some of those points in a minute, but if I could just go first to Genki. You're, you're going to talk a little bit, I think, about the challenge that I face as a tourist, which being Australian, I speak Australian really well, um, some other forms of English a little bit well, um, and uh, no other languages. So, Genki. Hi, good day. <laughs> um, I'm Genki Goto from Tokyo. And, um, yeah, uh, my comp I am CEO, uh, founder and CEO of Kototsuna Inc. Uh, that is a multilingual translation company. Uh, my back, um, I am a serial, serial entrepreneur and my background is a uh, e-commerce. Um, I started e-commerce company 25 years ago and that is a health product, uh, that is Kenko.com, that is one of the largest e-commerce company of health products in Japan. And I ran that company for 20 years and I sold it and then I started new business. That is uh, Kototsuna Inc. So um, I'm very brand new of this industry. And um, why I started this um, company is that um, my, uh, I, I'm from very rural part of uh, Japan uh, with population of about uh, 40,000 and in Kyushu. And um, I suppose that, um, that uh, in Japan, uh, Japan is very aging countries and uh, the economical growth is very low these days. 
So there are very few opportunities to grow, um, in especially rural areas. But I suppose that um, inbound traveling is one of the biggest opportunity for growth and, and uh, in those kind of areas. But unfortunately, the uh, people in rural areas are aging and they cannot speak any other languages. So, um, but uh, I was in e-commerce industry, so uh, I know about the very new technology, including AI and machine translation and those kind of things. So um, I started, um, I started new business to uh, eliminate language barrier to facilitate the travel uh, tourism industry. And um, so um, my company is now doing the, um, uh, facilitating, uh, facilitating the uh, cross messaging platforms um, messaging. That is, uh, for example, uh, Japanese use Line and uh, Chinese use WeChat and Korean use uh, Kakao Talk and many other people use um, WhatsApp or uh, Facebook messengers. And um, we enable the communication between different messaging platforms, um, for example, between Line and WeChat or Kakao Talk and Facebook Messenger. And then uh, we use uh, machine translation um, during the communication. So we allow the communication between those kind of uh, different uh, countries. So uh, especially in Asian countries, uh, yeah, the tourists, um, a, uh, most of tourists are Asians, and they speak different languages. So the tourism in Asia is very difficult um, because the language is different. And especially the, uh, the tourists, um, tourists' um, language capabilities not so high, so they tend to attend the uh, group, to, group tour, not FIT. And also the local areas have, have very low uh, language uh, capability. So um, yeah, there are the few communication, um, little communication between uh, local people and tourists. That is, I, I think that uh, that, um, that is one of the problem which causes the less spent money uh, in the, especially the local areas by uh, individual tourists. So I, I started the business for multilingual translation two years ago. Yeah. Arigato <laughs> <laughs> Um We've only got three panelists, unless another, any other panelists have arrived unknowingly. Um, no, in which case, what I'm gonna do is keep the conversation going a bit longer with the panelists and then open it up um, to as many comments and questions as people want to make. Um, as I said at the start, and some of you um, weren't here at the start, so I will repeat it. You have a comment, okay. Right, so as I said, we're, we're focused on tourism more generally, not just the questions in the Yes, I, uh, so. I own some hotels in the region, yeah, ranging from uh, you know, Beijing to Hong Kong to Taiwan to Singapore. So. Um, one thing that I noticed uh, in customer trends is that uh, younger people are now um, moving away from the big brands, the, from the big, uh, you know, so generic brands to try to, I think they're more, much more adventurous now. Younger people try boutique hotels, local, ryokans, and, um, you know, more of a, I, I think people try for a more local and unique experience. Whereas the older generation would, you know, want to stay in these trusted brand hotels and, you know, go for package tours. Young people now increasingly are much more independent with or without the ability to speak the local language. I think just because we have so much information on the internet, uh, they, they can plan their own travel. They want uh, unique experiences that they can... Uh, relish and, and you know show off to their friends and I think this is a trend where uh, I, I don't know how you know our industry will adapt to it but certainly a, a I, I see that as a mega trend I don't know if Mr. Shibata Mr. Goto would agree with me regarding that 
I think I think that's the uh, that's that that's definitely the trend that the uh, um, um, everywhere you know you, you see everywhere, and then the uh, um, so our media it's called Trip One One in Singapore is it is the definitely the one f that focus on sort of a new experiences, and then what we call alternative experiences in in travel. So, for example, we, we publish a lot of articles like, a, you know, like a, here's a top list of Airbnb properties in the city XYZ. Or here's the, uh, here's the uh, interesting things to do, local experiences um, in, in a city ABC. So, so we, we publish a lot of articles, and in those articles, you know, the, the younger people, like millennials, they love it. And then the, uh, this trend, you cannot really kind of... Um, you know, you, you you can't stop that, and then the uh, but uh, but I think at the same time I think at the uh, uh, um, legacy hotels in traditional hotels also started actually um, uh, finding their own answers, right? So a core hotel, for example, they they actually they 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 actually acquire the uh, one of the uh, uh, alternative accommodation companies called One Fine Stay. I think that's the one thing. So um, and the. Also, uh, um, company like Booking.com, you know, they, they started actually offering local experiences on their websites. So, again, so this trend, you cannot stop and then you need to embrace it. And then the, uh, for hotel, I think it's, you know, the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, big hotel brands also um, not only get into the private accommodation business like homes, but also like design hotels, right? So uh, I think uh, um, you know if I were the uh, the owner of like a traditional hotel chains, I think it's, you know you, I I have to think about offering a different set of uh, properties and then you know and uh, services to cater towards you know the, those young people's needs. Okay, can I can I just get you to go to uh, not, which I think segues nicely into the other part of the conversation we were yeah. having earlier, which is around um, the extent to which tourists are a homogenous group and the extent to which and we were talking particularly about Chinese tourists and the assumption that people have that all Chinese tourists are the same and I think you sort of disagree with that idea. So I think that segues neatly into what you're talking about in terms of the, of the you offer. Are you talking about the diversity of a Chinese? Uh, yes. Yes. Well. I mean, so that's uh, that's interesting. So the uh, uh, a lot of people actually think that the, you know sort of a stereotype of a Chinese uh, tourist actually they they actually uh, uh, travel in a group, right? And then you know kind of waving flag things, and then you know they, they go to the uh, maybe the Louis Vuitton shops and then buy the whole bunch of like branded products, and then you know then then they go to the Chinese restaurant for the lunch, you know no matter where they go, but that's definitely changing quite rapidly now. I think it's you know there are more and more like backpack is a good example. I think you know there's the we there's a website called uh, Mafengo and also uh, um, um, Chonyu. So those two websites are user generated content websites. It's like a TripAdvisor. It's like a tri you, you guys all know TripAdvisors, right? You know they, it's like a TripAdvisor, but the, for the Chinese, but particularly for younger generation. And they try to actually find their own experiences in overseas. And then they even exchanges all their different itineraries. And then and those are like a typical like a, um, um, a consumer behaviors by those independent Chinese travelers, right? So I think the time is actually changing very, very fast. I think, I mean, not only Chinese, but also I mean, uh, across the uh, different countries in Southeast Asia, I think the people definitely have a wide range of interests and then they go uh, they go on, on their own and then they, they actually travel independently. Diana, obviously um, people using your services are at the higher end of the tourism chain, food chain, in terms of uh, what they can afford to spend. But do you have a, a single group of people really that you're catering to or is it a very diverse range again? Actually, um, you know, I mean, Traditionally, uh, it's the very high end, you're right. But uh, just now, I, I mentioned that we are trying to, you know, um, package what we call pack travels. And, and those target uh, customers are not traditionally rich. 
uh, it's just that they need to travel with their pet and they will spend the money. So what we do is we consolidate the interest and we say, okay, uh, each month we will have one trip to Japan and it's a five day trip and this is how much it costs per person. And we just consolidate the interest and, um, and it's becoming very, very popular because uh, those pet travelers, they, they love their pets like they are children and they want to take them with them. So it's not necessary, you know, the ultra rich because once you consolidate it, um, you know, I would say 10 travelers, uh, it becomes quite affordable. Yeah. Um, um, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, contributors um, for Asia to be able to grow the, uh, um, the market of uh, tourism is actually the low-cost carriers, low-cost carrier airlines. You know, like Air Asia, for example, Scoot. Yeah. Um, so I think it's the, uh, uh, that actually triggers the, the demand of, uh, you know, um, um, stimulate the demand of uh, travel, uh, particularly for younger generations. And the, this is also an alternative way to travel too, right? Because in, 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 in back in the day, they only like a cafe, Pacific, Singapore Airlines, Japan Airlines, only Nippon Airways, those like a legacy national uh, flag carriers, but the now, locals carriers are everywhere, you know. Um, in Europe, I think, is, is even more. I think, you know, you, you see a Lion Airs, you know, those guys, um, you know, they basically disrupted the whole industry. And then uh, that, as a result, I think the younger people just really can travel all over the places. And I myself even, like, I, I can actually fly Singapore Airlines if I want, but I don't do that. Like, I flew uh, Scoot from Singapore to here. Well, not just because I wanted to save money, but it's just actually just, it doesn't make sense to pay, like, a thousand dollars for two hours flight, right? So, and, and then I sometimes actually joke about it. If I were running a, maybe a, a, a travel agency business, I want to probably package locals carriers and then probably, you know, Ritz Carlton's. Because you, know, you can actually save money on the, on the flights and you can actually spend more money on accommodations, right? So this is another way, another great example of the uh, sort of a wide range of variety of the products available in 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 a market now, I think it's and the younger people definitely like to adapt that. Ryanair is interesting actually because Ryan, Ryanair's business model started, as I understand it, with them reaching out to regional parts of Europe that didn't have high tourism, and um, getting those uh, local municipalities, regions, or whatever to invest money to pay. Uh, Ryanair to land at their local airports I and mean, I've flown to different airports in France and Spain and Italy which um, have two flights that come a day both Ryanair flights that's all they have and a, f a few sm small light aircraft that take off from the airfields otherwise and you go for one pound or one euro um, on the flight and, th and it's subsidized um, by the municipality because the municipality want that tourism revenue to come in um, that's where they get their benefits. So it's quite interesting what you're saying, how um, an interesting business model actually disrupted um, air travel. Uh, I have to confess that I have now flown my last ever Ryanair flight. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, un <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, um, Genki, can I come to you and, and just ask about um, you talk about having built this platform for, for tourists to be able to speak across Weibo, uh, WeChat, um, all the various different platforms that different countries are using. But are you actually seeing the take up of that? Are you actually getting people to use the platforms? Are they are people actually using these things? What sort of numbers have you got? Um, uh, we we launched that uh, that system two two months ago. So uh, now, currently, uh, several thousand users are using. And um, yeah, those um, use cases are including the, um, yeah, some, um, yeah, for, tour for, for example, uh, tourist information or at the hotel, they want, uh, they want to talk to each other, but uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to communicate. In that case, uh, they use um, on face-to-face. -to -face. And also, one of the, 
uh, yeah, big use cases are uh, that, uh, this is not tourism, but um, uh, Chinese people in China or the expats from other countries in China cannot use uh, Facebook Messenger and Line and those kind of uh, messaging platforms other than WeChat. So they use those kind of, um, uh, yeah, we, our service to connect from WeChat to, um, our, to Line or Facebook Messengers. And, um, and also we are now developing um, the, some other applications and uh, that is, for example, that um, uh, one is the broadcasting system. Uh, for example, uh, in, in, in Japan, uh, Kansai Airport uh, was locked out when the typhoon came in September. And also in Hokkaido, uh, there was the earthquake in September, and uh, many people are locked in in uh, Chitose Airport. And in those cases, um, inbound travelers suffered the very hard time because uh, there are, they, they cannot communicate well in, in Japanese. So um, now uh, we are now developing the new system that uh, we allow the broadcasting to uh, many uh, languages, uh, to, uh, to travelers with, uh, in many languages to their own SNS. Uh, just by scanning QR code. So in that in that emergency, um, if they have the they display uh, if the uh, airport display the QR code on the wall, then the foreign tourists uh, scan those uh, those QR code, then uh, they can get um, yeah um, up to date information by their own language. Um. I'm going to just bring us to infrastructure a little bit, um, and I'm going to come to our fourth panelist, um, whose name I've suddenly forgotten, even though I've met him before. Um, give him a tap, will you? <laughs> because I, because I, Anson, Anson, sorry, Anson. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could be Salish if you want to. Ans, Anson, I want to come back to the point you made though about how um, young people, particularly, are wanting different experiences and and not using the traditional infrastructure of tourism. Uh, how do we then um, invest in the right infrastructure that will continue to respond to the needs of uh, this new evolving set of tourists? This is always interesting because, you know, as business people, we always want scalability. That's why, you know, Mr. Shabata talks about these big Chinese tourist groups. It's easy, it's profitable to entertain busloads of people who want to just buy the same stuff, eat the same food, and follow the same tour guide. And, and we get lazy that way. Or else we go to the high end and just cater to those who like to fly their pets because they have no kids or they hate children, right? So, the, you know, so these are the two ends of the market. But I think, honestly, these markets are due for correction, you know. You're right, Mr. Shabata. I think the Chinese market is evolving very fast, right? The Chinese market is, is evolving very fast in that the older generation who is not very savvy are likely to be replaced by more worldly citizens educated in the West, speak some English, and, and want those new experiences just like young people from the West, you know, because the blogs, uh, what they call the key opinion leaders, KOLs, um, bloggers, they, they write in many different languages and they share their unique experiences and here comes the challenge as hotel owners, as tour operators, how do we do what is called mass customization? That is the challenge, you know. Not everybody will be able to afford to rent or buy a private jet, you know. Uh, not everybody's gonna be able to travel with their pets. Some of them, some of them, most people can't even, cannot even afford to, to raise a pet because they, they work, you know, during the day and they don't have a maid at home. So how do we do mass customization? Meaning scalability, but personalize those trips. Now, a lot of younger people, they're so internet savvy that they book everything themselves directly with these small business owners in hard to find places. In fact, there's almost a one-upmanship among young people when they post on WeChat, their friend circle, or Facebook, 
You know, they want to post unique experiences. There's a one-upmanship to say, hey, I discovered this thing. You know, I discovered a unique item. I discovered a unique fishing hamlet. I discovered a unique experience. You should try it. You know, th there's a, a certain pride of ownership for people, younger people, all over the world. India, China, Japan, America, Europe, Australia. You know, some of them like un extreme sports. Others like unique scenery, unique wildlife. And, and they post this stuff and they, they share this with their friends and they say, hey, have you tried it? And then they, so uh, I think it's gonna be a challenge to, to, for tour operators, for hotel owners to try to cater to this group. Uh, and, and this is because our infrastructure is stuck in that mass communication age where, you know, I talk to a lot of hotel owners, they don't know how to advertise. I have trouble spending our own advertising budget. You know, do we spend it on online banner ads? That's a thing of the past. How do we find the right key opinion leaders or bloggers to invite them to come into our hotels to write about their experience of staying in our hotels and make it interesting or exciting? You know, so this is, I think, the challenge. I, I, I think you brought up a very like, fundamental um, potential problem for the society, you know, like, um, because uh, when, you, when you think about the capacity of hotels, for example, um, it's, it's funny what's happening in Japan, for example. So we have a World Cup rugby coming up next year. And then in 2020, we have a Tokyo Olympics coming up, right? And then people are going crazy. So we, we don't have enough hotels, right? So the government included. So all of a sudden, people start investing a lot of money, you know, building a new hotels. But uh, at the same time, there's a statistics, right? I think there's some like 13% or something of the entire houses in Japan are empty, right? Because the, uh, the corporation is actually is aging and decreasing, right? So a lot of houses are actually empty now, right? Why? So the, when you look at the whole like hardwares, like houses, buildings, I think we have enough assets. Why you have to invest again? Like it, it's, it's a scary to actually spend on the capex again, right? If you're running a business. I think sharing economy is such a great thing, and then it is still early age. Like Airbnb is actually definitely uh, facing some challenges because of the regulations. Um, and then the... Uh, just Airbnb. What's that? Japanese government is basically there, Airbnb. No, 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 they didn't. They actually, no, they, they actually... It's impossible to do, it's very difficult to, to be an Airbnb person. Right, so, okay, so, no, no, what happened, what happened earlier this year is actually, so they, um, first of all, Airbnb was in a gray area, right? So there was no regulations. So earlier this why year, w why? Why do you need regulations? Why didn't? Why do you need regulations? Yeah, well, of course, you know, because, you know, if you are like a hotel owner, so, you know, you need to compete with them, right? So you need to have a level field, right? You need to have a level field. As I think it's a great idea to actually regulate in a good way. But right now, I think it's the, the new regulation is actually probably a little bit tougher than everybody expected. So the, uh, that's why, you know, a lot of uh, uh, homeowners or real estate owners are actually having a tough time to actually to run the Airbnb businesses. But, uh, but I, what I also heard that the government is actually now reconsidering to, to, uh, to, um, to deregulate. And so again, so this is actually still early stage for the sharing economy, Uber, same thing, right? Uber, they, a, lot of, a lot of challenges for Ubers all over the world. So I think it's, you know, the longer time, I think it may be 10 years, 20 years down the road, I think this sharing economy is definitely going to nonstop. But right now, I think it's just, like, it's just in the period where, like, you know, lots of things are actually changing. And then and some hiccups, some, uh, you know, um, some, uh, what is that called, like a pain in, in the uh, in early days is actually, is, it's definitely underway now, I think. So th this isn't a, sorry, you want to, yeah. please, go on. Uh, to be honest, the, the, uh, the old industries uh, do not like those kind of newcomers. And, and my ex yeah, I have experienced that I sued the government and I won at the Supreme Court for the rule change when I, I did e-commerce. And 
and at that time, also the, uh, the old people uh, tied with politicians and bureaucrats, and they, they changed, uh, they, 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 they uh, somehow bent the law and um, ordinary. And so those kind of issues are still remains in Airbnb and also Uber issues. Um, so I'm also not convinced that the share economy is here to stay. Um, I see a number of uh, large companies taking over aspects of the share economy on Airbnb mm -hmm. and so on. So you, you end up booking hotels through Airbnb these days and so on if you're not careful. Um, but can I um, open it up to comments and questions from around the floor? Yes, please. Um, and we go, we'll go anywhere you want to as long as it has a vaguely tourist-related um, point. Well, thanks very much. Phil O'Reilly from uh, New Zealand, a, a small tourism operation in the South Pacific. Um, uh, Lawrence, one of the reasons why your tourism spends so low is that your second biggest tourism market is New Zealand, and of course, and they all come over and stay with friends and family, so we're all cheap uh, when we deal with you. Um, my question, uh, and I'm interested in any thoughts uh, people around the table might have, is on uh, the social license to operate of tourism. Uh, you know, we, we're having an issue in New Zealand. We've now got 400 and some odd, maybe 500,000 Chinese tourists coming to New Zealand each year. Many of them go through little towns that were designed for about 5,000 people, and uh, they all go to the local toilet and want to get a cup of coffee and put a lot of strain on the infrastructure. And um, we kind of love them at one level, but we, you know, those people in those small towns, uh, the most picturesque small towns you can imagine, of course, aren't all that happy with this happening and uh, you know we've all got stories when we were kids uh, going to beaches where no one was and now we go to those same beaches we can't we can't walk around those beaches now because they're full of tourists so that's good for New Zealand we're making a lot of money and it's fantastic but it does cause issues around social license and uh, and and then you you run into a, a, a rather similar issue some of you have been raising it which which makes the problem even more complex and that is that Many of the people coming to New Zealand now want to want to have very unique experiences. One one in the newspaper just last week, the latest thing, the latest thing that the kids will be taking photos of on uh, Instagram is so uh, you can lie down with a cow, uh, a dairy cow, and you can cuddle a cow in a in a paddock. Now I wouldn't do that if I were you, uh, but anyway, some people want to do that. So you've got this this problem of of pressure and tension on particularly small town New Zealand. And at the same time, a desire for people to use this unique, or see this unique part of New Zealand, which is literally places that uh, go to a place that you, you can't do anything. That's the only place you can do it in the world. You know, so this this unique idea plus the the challenge of scale. So I'm interested in any thoughts people have about that, whether they're facing some of those issues. I know Vietnam faces some serious issues around social license to operate, given the pressure on the tourism sector here. Any thoughts about that? Any thoughts about how we might be able to overcome that? I just want to relate that to Anson's point, because I'd written down um, while, while, we, while we were thinking around key opinion leaders and how that puts pressure on particular areas. And thinking about New Zealand, of course, you know, you had Lord of the Rings um, and the... And the I mean, probably very good for, New, for the South Island particularly to some extent, but, uh, but also put, I think, a lot of pressure on a few key places where bits of the film were filmed uh, and so on. And the key opinion leaders do exactly the same uh, thing and put, put stress on small ecosystems quite often um, in, in ways that are almost unacceptable. Uh, how do we manage that, that problem of the unique experience which becomes completely non-unique once a thousand people have all stood in the same place and had the same selfie. Uh, I, I can suggest something but it's not likely to be popular because I think municipalities can do lotteries like uh, Bhutan. Bhutan heavily regulates the number of tourists. They auction these things off. It can cost a lot. That means if you're a backpacker, you're not well-to-do, chances are you cannot go to Bhutan. So one way to ration this is by having permits. You know, they have hunting permits, fishing licenses, and in the case of Bhutan, entry visas, which are very pricey. Now, this is not going to be popular because that smacks of elitism. And soon you're going to have Diana's clients bringing their pets who would occupy and buy these licenses instead of a, a, a hard-working but, but not so well-to-do youngster because they cannot afford the license. But, but so that's they're not one gonna, way. they're not going to go to Bhutan for their medical treatment, I can tell you that. But. 
Hello, so my name is Miko. I, I come from the Philippines. So as you may well know that Boracay Island was shut down, right? So I have some friends who actually live in the island. They, they run hotels, they run the tourism business. Um, so of course, uh, they do have now entry permits to limit the number of people who are allowed on the island. I remember visiting uh, Boracay when there was barely any people, you know. Um, to some extent, uh, it changed the experience. Um, there was pollution, but at the same time, it was also good for business. Um, I understand from my friends that uh, running a small mini hotel uh, at that island raked in more revenues than some friends from Manila, you know. So um, to some extent, it was both good for business, but also, uh, if not regulated properly, bad for the environment. Now, of course, um, they reopened the island a few weeks ago. And then now, um, but not all the infrastructure work has been put in place. So they did try to widen the roads. Of course, it had to destroy some establishments along the way. Um, but again, uh, I think this is with the hope of actually trying to rehabilitate uh, uh, or correct uh, a lot of mistakes that have happened. That said, I have heard that they are planning to shut down a few other places as well. Uh, currently, it's, uh, they're trying to limit the number of people, so um, that's correct. Um, so I remember I have some office mates who, upon opening, within the first week they were there, you know. So, um, and they did say that uh, they do check whether you have a booking there, they do try to validate. They, they now really limit the amount of people there uh, in, in that island. So um, now, of course, this makes me wonder how sustainable this will eventually be. How will it now change the investments that have been done? Um, I remember that uh, when I think um, it was like uh, two weeks before they shut down the island, I was also there. Um, and uh, there were a lot of uncertainty with regard to tour operators. Should we still continue selling tickets? Because will it really last for five months or will it extend further than that? You know. Um, so I think uh, having that kind of clarity, uh, I think both from the government standpoint and of course from uh, all the people and stakeholders involved will be very, very important. But I just want to add to that point um, uh, on like uh, how it stresses, let's say, uh, the environment. Uh, there was always this um, environmental tax that they have when you enter, like 100 pesos. You know, it's a very small amount, but it's supposed to help maintain whatever things that they were doing. But it was not exactly enough to really uh, address the large uh, infrastructure-related concerns that was happening in the island. I mean, that, also, that almost speaks to, that's both the, oh, sorry, John, did you want to come in or something? You're waving your hand, John. I was just going to say that, it, that what Nico was saying speaks to some extent to that um, infrastructure problem, but also to the social license again. And um, I really like the uh, expression social license here because I think it really sort of suggests about how, how tourism is to some extent imposed on communities. Um, and certainly I, w I was in uh, Mumbai earlier this year where um, the hotel that I was staying in was advertising tours around um, the uh, India's biggest slum. Um, and that seemed to me to be the, the most extreme form of tourism I could think of and probably the least satisfying form of tourism I could think of as well. But John, go. Yeah, I've done that slum tourism and also in Jakarta. I recommend it. But um, back on to, to Boracay, which is um, the same problem I, that Indonesia has with Bali, you know. Indonesia has, uh, you know, uh, many tourists going, but 50% of Indonesia's tourists go to Bali, even though Indonesia has 17,500 islands. And it seems to me that Boracay, I mean, you've got one beautiful island there, but you've got 7,000 other islands. Isn't part of the solution governments developing other destinations and promoting other destinations when you know you patently have so many other destinations that you know are attractive, and you know, people are crazy about Boracay. But I, I come from Sydney in Australia, and quite honestly, the Boracay beach is nice, but it's not fantastic. There are many other ones in the Philippines that could be developed. Can I just quickly add? So um, I'm Janine, uh, and um, I'm currently in education. But before I was a hotelier for quite a long time. Um, my company, uh, I was in the headquarters, so um, I was covering 1,200 hotels. Um, so I've seen their, uh, how they've crowded to Bali, right? And um, and I've also worked in the Maldives, and those two places have something in common, right? Which is very fragile um, ocean uh, or the very fragile kind of um, ecosystem. Yeah. 
And, um, and my experience in Bali versus my experience in Maldives is completely different. Um, in Maldives, um, the their diver or the diving instructor uh, would tell us, okay, never to touch their, um, their, the, un anything underwater. Um, and uh, there, are, there are marine bio biologists who explain us different things. Um, however, in Bali, uh, when I was diving, um, the diving instructor would be like, oh, you want to touch that? Oh, go, go ahead to touch it. Or, oh, I, he, this is my stick. I'm just going to poke it to see how it goes, right? So I think um, uh, while uh, the, the quota thing is not really, it, it's not popular, but how about uh, the industry itself being more responsible and acting in a more sustainable way, right? So if there's a tourist, you know, um, throwing things in the beach, how, how about telling them not to, right? So uh, in, in the Maldives, um, you know, w we've done it uh, quite well and uh, the, the, the results are quite, um, you know, together in protecting the fragile ecosystem. But um, sadly, in Bali or in the Philippines, I don't see the same thing. Um, and then uh, to the poverty tourism, uh, well, um, when I, because now I work with the underprivileged people and I ask them how they feel about it, actually, they don't feel quite good. Uh, and I, they felt like they were in a zoo. Really? Yes, they, they uh, felt dehumanized. Um, and uh, there is another form of tourism coming up, which is on, on top of slum tourism, um, it's poverty tourism, where tourists want to go to help out in the orphanage. Um, and I, I guess a lot of you uh, who live in developing countries know that um, people running those orphanages often take advantage of, uh, and try to make the kids live in really sad, as sad looking as possible so that they will get more money and a lot of times those money don't really get to the kids. So I would really um, uh, ask uh, us everyone to <laughs> do those tours really with high caution. I think, you know, ultimately uh, we are a world becoming, you know, there, there are more and more people who can afford to travel. And what Mr. Shabbat has said about, you know, um, discount airlines, it creates an even bigger market. And, and Airbnb does the same. You know, it democratizes travel. And, and you know, we're going to have to come to terms with that either, you know, in, a, in the form of a raffle. Like, for instance, I, if I go to Broadway, let's say New York, and I want to see a show, you either pay through the nose to buy a ticket to a popular show, or, or there's a raffle lottery system, and so not everybody gets to go, uh, or in the alternative, much like hunting licenses, fishing licenses, or Borakai passes, you've you got to charge extra for it to, to use pricing and the market mechanism to, to limit people. And it's not going to be a popular thing to say, but to save the ecological system, something needs to be done. I, I do not think that the current Way, wave of uh, you know um, new countries you know, with a rising middle class, mass tourism, uh, hitting all the major popular spots, and those spots are yet to be discovered, but soon by bloggers and so popularized very quickly. Um, if we don't deal with that, you know, we're, we're soon we're going to start losing habitats and unique ec ecological systems pretty damn fast. Yeah, please keep going. <laughs> uh, just as a way of, of responding to all of that, I, uh, it's really, it's pretty hard to limit numbers into a country like New Zealand. Uh, it's a big place, so uh, it's not like Bhutan. But actually what we found, just to contribute back to the conversation, we found we have actually got some rationing going on. If you try and find a hotel room in Auckland in February, well, good luck. Even I can't find a hotel room in February, and I go all the time, right? And the, and the price will be triple what I normally pay for it. So effectively some rationing going on. If you want to see some marketing for New Zealand tourism in the high summer, you won't see any. All of the marketing is in the shoulder season and in the off season in winter. We've got, the, we've got an incredible growth of, of uh, uh, events, uh, uh, you know, uh, cultural events and indoor events and so on to attempt to attract both domestic and overseas tourists in the off season and our winter uh, to New Zealand. That's all part of it as well. And we do have rationing on some of our national parks and national walks and some of our some of our iconic experiences there is effectively rationing because you simply can't fit that many people on the walk, for example, the route burn or the Milford track. You simply can't, you simply can't do it. The other, the other point I'd make is that we have a, a really, the, the point about um, people raping the environment, there's a bit of that that's gone on, but increasingly 
uh, what we're finding is that tourists appreciate being told not to do that. They appreciate being told, hey, listen, uh, you know, can you be careful, please, because it needs to be here for your children. We, we want them to see this magnificent site when they come back as well. So a classic example of that, so two very famous glaciers in New Zealand, the Fox and the Franz Josef, are both remarkable glaciers that end up in, in rainforest. So you can walk off bush into a, into a glacier. Now, they've been naturally uh, 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 going backwards for a few years now, but people used to be able to walk on them. As a kid, I could walk on them. You can't now because they're too fragile, and everybody gets told that and understands that. So tourists actually appreciate that. Not all Chinese tourists do, and that causes some challenges for a, from a license to operate issue. Some of the low-level tourists don't. But increasingly, we're using many of the tools that are being talked about around here with some success, uh, and we're just about to introduce a border tax, which I'm not sure is going to work, but nevertheless, we'll give it a go, uh, to try and help fund some of that as well. So we're trying all of those messages, so watch this space. So, oh, sorry, please, yeah, keep going. Hello, um, my name is Nat Wong, and I'm the, the founder of uh, an organization called What to Inception. Um, you know, I, um, I'm really concerned about uh, the environmental damage that tourists uh, are causing, especially around the islands. I think everybody of us realize now how much many uh, bottles uh, of plastic end up in the oceans. And uh, I've been on a mission um, for a couple of months now to try to, to, to talk and, and connect with uh, hotels, resort, uh, people working in the tourism environment to try to find a way to get rid of pet bottles. And uh, I came here actually to, to try to introduce a new technology that uh, allows organizations to bottle their own reusable bottles that are made of glass or aluminum. I brought uh, a sample here. Um, and what's great about this is that not only it helps the hotels to reduce their bottle cost, but also to protect the environment. Um, and um, yeah, I was wondering around, you know, uh, the people around here, have you been uh, trying to look for, for such solutions? And uh, what do you think of the development of ecotourism? Um, have, is there something that you think is growing or, or not? Thank you. I just want to quickly add, so um, yeah, my uh, hotels that we used to work with have, um, I think 10, 10 years or 10 years or 12 years ago, um, were using glass, glass bottles or um, not aluminum, but mainly glass. Um, then we got complaints from our clients because they can't bring the bottle along with them on excursions, right? So I think um, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, if today the, it's what the consumer wants, I think the hotel will be more than happy to adopt it, right? So it is more, um, the, the onus is more on the consumer rather than hotels, yeah, because we, we, we've used to um, do bottles. Um, Sher Sheraton used to do bottles. But, but it, it is interesting how um, most tourists, um, for example, use the towels once in their hotel room. <laughs> they, don't ha they don't keep them and have them, re have them for the second day. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tomoko Hoshino from Japan. I'm kind of a world traveler. <laughs> so I'm very uh, <coughs> concerned about the travel any place. And uh, I, ask, I request uh, Ms. Matter uh, the, from uh, Mad Travel from Philippines to come here because they have a uh, the very good organization where the traveler to uh, you know, um, participate as a social business planner when they come to the Philippines <coughs> and to work as a volunteer to get the rise to any business, social business there. So a system, I like that system. I, I, I really love to uh, uh, travel, uh, visit them, but I, could, I couldn't not, not do that. So I asked uh, them to come here. But unfortunately, maybe because of the typhoon or something, they cannot come, uh, unfortunately. But uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, next action, not only one-time travel, um, in, for example, in Japanese, tabi no haji wa kakisute. It means like uh, one, any shameful activity in travel will be forgettable. So it's not good for the, the uh, in, in Japanese word. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the, so, the, as a traveler, we have to educate like a kind of rule of, of for example, I've been to uh, Masai Mara in Africa last month. That time, the you know um, the 
uh, rangers uh, educate traveler to have a rule in the Masara, you know, at the animal uh, conservation area first. So we, our uh, traveler's action will be, you know, in the regulation is very strict. Too. So that kind of a rule, if the real, uh, the, you know, uh, facilitated side loved the land so well, so I think that is the kind of the regulation will be done any, any place to uh, be a sustainable, to uh, develop a sustainable way like you, you did. And I think, I think so, just thank you. <laughs> it's an interesting paradox emerging here, I think, in our conversation, which is really around um, how, how we started off, or I started off anyway, suggesting that how do we grow the tourism industry in Asia um, from its current uh, pretty strong base to an even stronger base. But we've sort of moved somehow to rationing it, thank you Anson, um, and thinking about how, how we um, do that with, with um, a form of social license to operate, I suppose, among those communities that want it, and also protecting those ecosystems. And I'm wondering whether actually the, the answer to that is partly rationing, but it's also straightforward um, not providing the infrastructure um, that would actually bring the tourists into those areas where we don't want them. So making travel hard, making accommodation hard or limited and so on um, is one way of actually providing that rationing because people won't travel. Anson, you're going to respond to that, I can see. Yeah. You look, uh, governments, local governments will always want more tourism because that means more funding, more income, more revenue. But, you know, tourism, just like any other industry, produces what economists call negative externalities. These are things that people outside the tourism industry has to bear in terms of costs. It's the local inhabitants, it's the local habitat, the local wildlife, the local ecology. So um, I think municipal and provincial governments need to be responsible and not get too greedy because there is a natural limit to natural scenery. There's a natural limit even to Broadway in New York and Manhattan. You know, there is no limitless capacity to entertain people. If you try to do that, the quality of the entertainment or the value of the ecosystem, the uniqueness of the habitat, habitat will be destroyed, will get altered. So ultimately, I think it's not just to educate tourists, it's also to educate the uh, receiving end, those provincial, municipal governments that are popular destinations, that are trying to develop tourism, to develop it in, in a responsible way where you don't get too greedy because if you do, you end up you know, causing your local inhabitants and your local environment sometimes irreparable damage. And, and that would be sad. That would be sad. You know, Asia is rising and there is a rising middle class so naturally short haul tourism will rise whether you like it or not so how do we deal with that in a way that's responsible not just to ourselves but to those who follow us our children our grandchildren so they're not just going to see our home movies and say gosh that really looked good how come it looks so bad right now so degraded sorry to butt in i'm not a i'm not a speaker but um there is another. There is another path. To, I agree with some of that. Certainly for the more iconic things. I've, ne I've never been to the Notre Dame in Paris, even though I go there a lot. The reason is the queue is always so long. I just can't be bothered. Uh, so there's certainly a case for that kind of thing. But there's another thing too, which I think is making the untrendy trendy. Uh, you know, when when I was a uh, 15 years ago, uh, when I first came to Wellington, New Zealand, where I lived, the capital, where the weather is famously awful, windy and raining, uh, and I would have seen one tourist a decade in Wellington. You know, there was nobody, no tourists were there. It was awful. Now, through a whole bunch of investment in the city and the bright ideas of entrepreneurs, it, within a 10 minute walk from my house in Wellington, I can visit nine breweries. Micro breweries have taken off in Wellington in a big way. 10 minutes walk, nine breweries, that's a lot of beer. Now, that has led to Wellington, the most untrendy town you could imagine, 15 years ago, now being seen as one of the trendiest cities in Australasia. People go there for the weekend. It's extraordinary, I can't believe it, but it's true. 
Now, I think, so I think there's a real opportunity to develop new product that is exciting and interesting in its own way and it would be really hard to degrade Wellington because the, whatever you put on the street, the rain's going to wash away in 10 minutes' time. So you can actually create new opportunities. I think. So it's not just about limiting numbers, although it is for some product, no, no question about that. It's also about growing the capacity for the country to accept more tourists in areas which have traditionally been potentially underdone. And, and another good example of that, a world-famous example, of course, is the example of Provence in France, which was which was a rural backwater until Peter Mayle wrote his famous novel, and now millions of visitors go there every year, of course, creating all sorts of stress in those little villages and communities. But nevertheless, it's a great example of how you can take otherwise, an otherwise untrendy piece of France and turn it into one of the great, greatest tourism products in the world. So there's, there's both ways here. And I come from Canberra, which is the world's third, according to Lonely Planet, is the world's third most visitable, visitable city in 2018. Um, I sometimes wonder what goes on in the minds of Lonely Planet. But um, are there any, are there any um, final points uh, before we close? I, I know that Anson has to go to another panel now. He's on, on the plenary, so... Uh, maybe I'll just add um, uh, uh, another story on top of your, your different examples. Um, so, you know, when, uh, when Thailand opened, um, the first uh, most popular destination apart from Bangkok is Phuket, right? So Phuket is highly populated, uh, crowded, uh, you know, and not that pleasant. And what the Thai government did um, uh, for some way is completely different, right? So instead of allowing budget flights to come in, they really controlled the flights. So no budget flights in and only, um, uh, I think, I can't remember, there are only a couple of flights in, right? So with that, they actually managed to um, create some way into like a premium location where the beaches are always going to be, you know, powder, white powder sand clean versus Phuket. So I guess other than just, yeah. So, yeah, but instead of, uh, and, and for the people who are determined to go, they can take a long bus right there, right? But it, you have to be really determined. So instead of using a price point as a determinant, right, it's uh, the, the inconvenience. <laughs> as the, yes. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt your conversation. Just like I want to share, uh, I'm I'm Japanese, but based in the Hanoi in Vietnam. So uh, uh, we have in Vietnam uh, because nobody from Vietnam is a panelist. So uh, in Vietnam, we found uh, largest cave in middle of uh, largest cave, Don Suan Cave, largest cave in the world, and uh, of course, like a local government, try to attract the tourists to, to uh, build. Uh, uh, cable and uh, like hotels and everything like a big uh, tour, uh, tourist community but uh, this is so beautiful and it's so huge cave so um, uh, local people against the, uh, the movement and uh, they finally won and they tried to protect uh, the cave uh, um, um, uh, touchable place. Uh, so uh, this is also like uh, we were talking about sustainable development to the tourist. And also in Japan we have uh, like Oze. Oze is a place uh, we need to protect. Uh, so limited access to the people. How many people can uh, get access to the whole year? So um, just to, um, I want to share about Vietnamese stories. So they have a huge. Uh, uh, protest uh, movement uh, against uh, the uh, tourism. Uh, of course, local government and the national government do want to promote more uh, tour tourists to Vietnam. I think that's, uh, that story almost summarizes our conversation in some respects, doesn't it? Because it, is, it, it touches on that social license, it touches on that rationing point, it touches on the ecosystems that we're trying to protect and the, the, the sort of long-term sustainability of the tourist industry. So I think on that note, um, we will wrap up. Um, I do thank you, all of you, for having the resilience um, to not bow to the peer pressure to go off into Ho Chi Minh City and do some sightseeing, but actually to stay in, in the session and uh, enjoy the, join the conversation. Can I um, ask you to join me in thanking our three panelists and everybody else that contributed, so thank you very much.